Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Jobs. I like the music, thank you. Yeah, I picked that out. That's where they let me do that. They let me pick the music. Um, well, thanks again for, for coming to D. Sure. And I thank Howdy. you. Thank you in advance for uh, the joint session with Bill Gates we're going to do tonight. We're not going to talk about that now, but thank you for doing that. Um, let me ask you a question that may seem odd. You, you've changed the name of Apple this year, and uh, you certainly have this enormous business that I think uh, 10 years ago people wouldn't have expected you to have in music. So what businesses uh, uh, we're in, are Apple, uh, is Apple in? Yeah, Apple's in two businesses today and uh, a hobby. And we're about to add a third business. So we'll, we'll very shortly be in three businesses and a hobby. A hobby, a hobby. okay. And the businesses are, uh, one, our Mac business, which we love and is growing really well. Uh, the second is our music business. And each of those two are about $10 billion businesses for us. Um, and the third business we're about to get in is the phone business, handsets. You have a phone? You're about to have a phone? About to have a phone. I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. OK. And uh, I'll send you one. Thanks. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> And then the, the hobby is, uh, is Apple TV. And uh, it's, it's, the reason I call it a hobby is because a lot of people have tried and failed to you know, make that a business. Uh, everybody from you know, TiVo to Microsoft, to, you know, everybody's tried. And it's a hard problem. And so we're trying. And it's a business that's you know, hundreds of thousands of units a year, but it hasn't really crested you know, to be millions of units per year. And I think if we, if we work on it and improve things over the next uh, Next year, 18 months, we can, we can crack that. I want to come back to that, because yeah. you have something to show uh, related to Apple TV today. Um, in, a couple of your, in your first couple of appearances here, I asked you, uh, you know, you gotten good critical uh, reviews on the Macs that you did after you came back to the company, and uh, uh, you introduced the iMac, and the new laptops and so forth, but you really, your share, uh, the needle didn't seem to move on your share. Uh, from what I can tell, something is happening with share there, or at least with, with sales. So talk about the Mac business and where you think it is. Um, well, we, you know, we all use Macs at Apple. We love the Mac. And so we're steadily trying to improve things, as everybody in our industry is. And we, th we think we make the best notebooks in the world. We think we make the best desktops in the world. And uh, our share in notebooks is, is ahead of the industry. We're about two-thirds notebooks, one-third desktops, and the industry is about 40% or so uh, notebooks. And we've always been a little ahead there. And I, I can see a time when notebooks are even going to be you know, 80 90% of what we sell. Um, we're also always improving our operating system. Generally, we have a release every 18 months or so. And uh, we had a really big release uh, about 18 months ago that we didn't get much credit for, but it was actually uh, Mac OS X Tiger, which is our current release, on Intel, yeah, because we switched the whole product line to Intel right. processors. And that's a, if, for anyone that's ever tried to do anything like that, that's a huge thing to do. Uh, and we did it really well, I think. I mean, it was very seamless for the customers. And, and uh, so that work, worked very well. And the growth that we've seen uh, over the last several quarters, really since we got through that Intel transition, uh, has been um, about three times the market growth rate. So we're, we've been picking up market share for the last, uh, you know. In other words, the overall PC growth rate is X, and Mac growth is 3X. Yes. Is that worldwide or US? That's worldwide. And in the US, is if it? You look at the, if you, you parse out the US numbers, it's even more than that. It approaches 5X. And your market share is what? Uh, you know, if around you, six or something, or am I wrong? You, if that? you measure it worldwide, it's like three. If you measure it in the US, depending on who you listen to, it's five to six. If you look at US retail for notebooks, it's 12. You know, so it depends on how you tweed the numbers together. There aren't really great numbers out there. As an example, if you look at US retail, uh, you know, our, we have double digit market share, but it doesn't include our web store, but nor does it include Dell's web store. So since Dell doesn't give us their numbers, we can't really calculate uh, you know, what the consumer market share might be versus the enterprise market share. Um, 
this is going to sound like a funny question, but <clears throat> there are people when you change your name to Apple Inc. and you announced that you were doing the iPhone in addition, of course, to the iPod and the Apple TV. There are people who said, well, you're, this is your gradual exit out of the computer business, the personal computer business. Mm. Right, do you remain committed to the personal computer business? Oh, yeah, totally. Totally. I mean, as an example, if you come to our Worldwide Developer Conference, uh, which is uh, a week from this coming Monday, we'll have the largest attendance we've ever had there, and we're rolling out the next generation of our operating system, Leopard, which will ship in October. Now, it's it, massive investments we're making in that business. We love it. Okay. Um, we haven't seen a big change in the iPod. Uh, if we put iPhone aside, you did identify it as a separate business. I know there's an iPod in the iPhone, but uh, for a while, um, are, are, are you uh, planning some big new iPod model or iPod platform or change? So a while means since last September. Uh, since last September, I guess right. This is a fast moving business. Right. Uh, yeah, we, we generally don't don't talk yeah, but last September you didn't do a whole, it wasn't like you introduced the Nano last September or something like well, that. Well, new Nano. A new Nano, I understand. But I mean, not a whole new model of the iPod. Okay. Okay. So? <laughs> it sure felt like that with all the work that went into it, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll concede to that. So I wasn't taking your feelings into account. I was just looking right. at the, <laughs> you know. So, as we look forward, all I, can, uh, all I should really say is that uh, we're working on the best iPods that we've ever worked on, and they're awesome. And I, I can't wait really? till they're done. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, moving right along, uh, you, uh, what phone are you carrying? You have a phone with oh, you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you want to show it? You want to sure. wave it around? Just a little thing here. Best iPod we've ever made, by the way. That's the best iPod you've best ever made. Best iPod we've ever made. Best uh -huh. phone we've ever made, too. <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> um, are you still on track to ship that yeah. uh, when? Late June. Late June. Yeah. That means like the very last day of June, or what does that mean? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would say in the latter part of June. <laughs> <laughs> the latter part of June, OK. And it'll be available in volume. It's, it's uh, Sure hope so. Yeah. and and. Well, you and other companies have sometimes shipped products, and the I volume know. wasn't there right at the beginning. So I'm I asking. think we'll ship a lot of them. Will it be enough? Uh, you know, I don't know. I hope not. <laughs> OK. And uh, do you expect to sell most of these at your own stores or through Singular, or do you have? Uh, we're going to be selling these in our own stores and through Singular, which is now the new AT&T. Yeah, thanks. And, uh, <laughs> Just like the old AT&T, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, they've got you're, like... You're a lot nicer to cell phone companies than you were last time you were on the stage. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting. <laughs> I, don't, I, you know, I don't know what to we've gotten to, We've gotten to know some of the players, and uh, we haven't sold a phone yet, but Singular's been really great with us, I have to say. By leaving you alone, basically. Uh, no, actually, not by leaving us alone. They did a deal with us. We did a pretty different kind of deal than they'd ever done before. And, and it bent a lot of their, it, it bent or broke a lot of their rules. Uh, they'd never done anything like this. And they did it with us without ever seeing the phone. We wouldn't show it to them. And so that's what we call due diligence? I mean, no, it, you, know, you know what it was? It's like, and we, we kind of did this in return, because we don't know much about how they work either. If you talk to great venture capitalists, they'll tell you that they invest in people, not ideas. Even if the ideas are great, they're really investing in the people. And I think Singular invested in us. They took a gamble on us. And, and likewise, we took a gamble on them. And uh, so I, I will never forget that. Do you th why do you think they did it? Do you think they did it because they wanted to associate your brand with theirs? You have a hot brand. They're relaunching their company. I think they did it for two reasons. Um, the first reason they did it was because Music on phones hasn't been so successful so far. And they really wanted to do something good with music on phones. And they knew with the iPod built into the phone, we could do that. The second reason, though, I think is even more profound. And that is that they have spent, they along with everyone else in the business, have spent and are spending a fortune to build these 3G networks. Right. And so far, there ain't a lot to do with them. 
Uh, you know, people have not voted with their pocketbooks to sign up for video on their phones. It hasn't really worked. So they've got a lot of bandwidth, but these phones are not capable of taking advantage of it because their internet experience is so poor. You, you've used the internet, or you've tried to use the internet on your phone, and it's terrible. They have lousy browsers. I mean, you don't get the internet. You get the baby internet or the mobile internet or something bizarre. And what people want is the real internet on their phone. And they, they believe that we could deliver that, and uh, we are going to deliver that. And so we're going to be able to take advantage of some of the investments they're making in this bandwidth, I think, in a, an entirely new way. We'll see. And be, because it's obviously, I mean, your own goals that you set for sales of the, of the iPhone were not gigantic and enormous. I mean, you said, I think, in 2008, you wanted to sell 10 million. Am I right about that? And that, that's good. I'm not saying it's bad. But I mean, in a billion dollar, uh, a billion unit market, that's 1%, right? Yeah. So they couldn't have signed the deal with you because they wanted a high volume product, per se. Well, again, a billion units is the worldwide number. Uh, the US number is obviously a lot less than that. So since we'll be selling primarily in the US and to some extent in Europe by then, uh, it's a little bit bigger than 1%. But we're newcomers. We, we, people have forgotten more than we know about this. OK. All right. Um, any features of the iPhone that you haven't announced that you would like to share with us here today? Uh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That. Well, you brought uh, something uh, new in your hobby business, as yeah. you put it, uh, show. Or, or actually, before we get to that, let's, uh, let's just uh, mention, you put out a press release this morning. I don't know, uh, everybody has been sitting here uh, paying rapt attention to the speakers, but you put out a press release this morning uh, announcing two things. Uh, I guess the bigger one was uh, that you've begun to sell these uh, non-copy protected uh, songs on the iTunes store right. uh, from uh, EMI. Is it only EMI? or uh, it Right now it's just EMI, but there's uh, uh, zillions of independents that are also jumping on this bandwagon. So as fast as we can now get their stuff encoded, you'll see more and more on there. Okay, and those I, as we've said before, I think over half the songs we offer on iTunes will be offered in what we call iTunes Plus, which is our DRM-free, higher quality audio versions uh, by the end of this calendar year. And this is all in the same store. It's all integrated. Same store. Yeah. So, it, but doesn't, you know, one of the things about your store has been it's been pretty simple. Doesn't yeah. this, isn't this going to add complexity? I'm well, we worked really hard at that. What, what we do is um, the first time you go to buy one of these iTunes Plus songs, uh, it asks you, it says, hey, uh, would you like us to only offer you iTunes Plus where it's available? And, uh, and most people will say yes if they like iTunes Plus. And so it just substitutes the iTunes Plus song in, just one song, one price, $1.29. And whenever they're available, you get those. So it's okay. pretty simple. Right. And then we have another cool thing, which is we're offering people uh, a special offer to upgrade every song that they've ever bought from iTunes to an iTunes Plus version if it's available for 30 cents a song or 30% uh, uh, of the current album price, whichever is, you know. And that, you, that's just some automatic syncing yeah. process? It just well, we know what we've sold, so we just download new versions and substitute okay. them. Yeah. Okay. Any uh, other movement on the record labels coming? Uh, oh, we're, you know, we're, we're working with them. It's, um, as you know, the music companies ship 90% of their music DRM-free today, because all CDs are DRM-free. Right? And that's how all the music's distributed. So we've gone to them and said, look, you're, you're shipping 90% of your music DRM free. Uh, customers are willing to pay a little bit more to get their downloaded music DRM free too. And why don't we do this? Plus, this solves all the interoperability problems and things like that. And uh, we were successful in persuading EMI. And hopefully, over the rest of this year, we'll be successful in persuading uh, most uh, or all of the rest of the labels. Some people have said, you know, you wrote this open letter about this. Um, a lot of your rivals were already lobbying the record labels for a long time, partly because they thought it was a way to, uh, you know, break your, your hold on the market or reduce your share because of this idea that there was lock-in. In other words, mm -hmm. I buy a bunch of uh, songs protected by your DRM. They're on my iPod. Even if they're only a minority of the songs on the iPod, it makes me much more reluctant to... Uh, buy a different device, uh, even if something about that device is attractive to me, because I can't play these songs on there. Um, 
were you just kind of getting ahead of the train that was already moving when you wrote that letter? And well, again, if you, if you look at the total number of iPods we've sold, and you look at the total number of songs we've sold on iTunes, it's, it's less than 25 per iPod. So, and the average iPod user has hundreds of songs on their iPod. Right. So they're clearly not getting the majority of their songs from iTunes. It, it turns out they're not even getting even a medium-sized minority from iTunes. And so this whole notion that somehow we have a lock-in, that iTunes is locking people in to buy iPods, is ridiculous. And since iPods can take any, you know, they can take any MP3 from anywhere and play it, right. the notion that if you buy an iPod, you, you get locked into iTunes is equally ridiculous. You can get MP3s from anywhere. Matter of fact, most people do. They rip their CDs or they get music in other ways. In other ways. Uh, so, and the vast majority of their music they get in other ways. So what, the way we've always felt is if we have the best music player, we're going to sell iPods. If we have the best music store, we will continue to pioneer people buying music. And um, we work really hard on both of them, but we've never felt that one was significantly helping the other. We felt that we had a great solution here, and people were using well, you're, you're, it. Well, I mean, your, your business, or this part of your business, is really the iPod. I mean, I know that you, mm -hmm. I think, you make a little money, or at least you don't lose any money on the iTunes store, but the business is the iPod, not the... You know, you're, you're, you're the business. Well, there's, there's, there's three pieces to it. There's the iPod, there's iTunes, the jukebox, which runs on PCs or Macs and is free, right? And you don't even have to use it with an iPod if you don't want to. As a matter of fact, many people don't. And then there's the online store in the cloud, right? Right. But the iPod is the biggest part. I mean, the iTunes, the client, so it makes is the most free. Money. The store doesn't make all that much money because most of whatever uh, I pay for a song goes we give to, to the, the label. Music companies, that's right. So you know your 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 big business is the iPod, and Correct. the question is, do you jeopardize that when DRM goes away by uh, uh, breaking the kind of the you know the the, the hold or the tie between the store and the well? Again, if people device. are getting you know the vast majority of music for their iPods from places other than the iTunes Store. I think the iPod's winning because it's the best music player, or it's the preferred music player. And our philosophy is we better make the best music players if we want to keep winning. So we work real hard at it, and hopefully we will continue to do that. Is the iPhone a wireless iPod, or is it a phone that has an iPod in it? I know that sounds weird, but I mean, what's the it's right three way things. for people to think about it's that? It's three things. It's the best iPod we've ever made. It's uh, an incredibly great cell phone. Uh, people are probably overlooking that part of it, thinking, well, all cell phones are the same. But we've really revolutionized how you use a cell phone. If it was nothing but a cell phone, it'd be really successful. And then the third thing is, uh, it's the internet in your pocket for the first time. And if it, was any, if it was any one of those three, it would be successful. If it was just the internet in your pocket, you know, it would be what the, the Sony Milo aspired to be. Uh, if it was just the best iPod we've ever made, we'd sell a lot of them with that. And if it was just a phone, we'd do pretty well with that, too. But it's all three of them. And, uh, and they, you know, they play off each other. How much debate was there? I don't even know if you have any debate at Apple. I don't know. But Lots. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. But I always imagine that it's like the UN Security Council and you have a veto, right? No, it doesn't work that way. If you want to hire and keep really bright people, then you, you can't tell them what to do. OK. Very often. Right. <laughs> OK. <laughs> like once, once a year, maybe twice, you get to do that. You can just overrule it. You have a but... silver bullet now and then, uh, but, but basically, you, you don't do that. So what, at Apple, it's, it's about ideas. And we argue about ideas constantly. So how much argument or debate was there about the decision not to have a physical keyboard on the iPhone? Uh, None. None? None. No. So there's this whole world of millions of people, and, the, and, and you know, if you look at RIM, sales are growing, people who are absolutely addicted to these devices with physical keyboards, and you guys just, you had no one yeah. in Cupertino who thought that was a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. Why? Why not? Uh, for a few reasons. One, once you actually use a touch display like this, it's like, 
Hi there. Uh, That's our official photographer. I see. Okay. Hi, official. He's photographer. taken your pic picture yeah. before, yeah. Sounds like a machine gun. All right. Um, so well, that could be your next ho hobby product, you know, a quiet camera. That would be good. Um, once you use this magical display, there's no going back. It, it's unbelievable. And uh, so there, there's a few advantages. Number one, we actually think we've got a better keyboard. And it takes a few days of getting used to it, you know, like it does with any small keyboard. But uh, I'll bet you dinner that after using it for a week, when you do get your hands on one, uh, you will think it's really great. Really great. Because That's a we can pretty do gutsy that, bet, because yeah. most of these on screen, all of these on screen keyboards I've tried, I have not thought were as good as a physical keyboard. Uh -huh. But yours is better. Yeah, we think so. Again, you get, it takes a week to, it basically, you have to learn how to trust it. Once you learn how to trust it, you fly. Yeah. Okay. All right. And the other nice thing about it, of course, is that we can use that physical space for other things when you don't need a keyboard. Right, right. Keep and the other thing, at, 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 uh, and you can keep changing the user interface as you, you know, come up with new ideas, new applications. And we were talking with the folks at Singular one time, and they said, well, we have to have a button for this. And we said, oh, don't worry about that. We'll add it after we ship. And they hadn't seen the phone yet. They didn't know anything about it. And, uh, and they looked at us like, huh? <laughs> yeah. We said, don't worry about it. Um, so yes, it, it provides incredible flexibility to create great user interfaces uh, for different applications. And you, you, know, you don't take up half the space of this thing with a, with a physical keyboard. But in addition to that, once you learn how to trust the keyboard, it's a better keyboard. How much time do you think you have uh, before people kind of copy at least the overall form factor of the thing? I mean, there are some things around the LG Prada and some other phones that sort of look like this. And, and I ask that because you were forced or you made a decision because of the FCC process to announce this thing right. much earlier than you usually announce products yes. at Apple. And was there a cost to that? I mean, are people going to be able to move faster? You know, if you zoom out of the whole thing and you say, why does the iPod exist? Why is Apple successful in this business? What would the answer be? It would be because the Japanese consumer electronics companies, who were the preeminent hardware makers of consumer electronics until recently, couldn't do software work as well as needed to be done. Right? Yep. If you really look at the iPod, it's software. It's a software product in beautiful hardware. It's software in the device. It's, as we said, software on the PC or the Mac. And it's software in the cloud with the store. It's software wrapped in a beautiful package. And the Japanese consumer electronics companies couldn't make the leap to create that kind of software. And that's why Apple enjoys the success it does with the iPod. If you look at handsets, it looks very similar. The handset manufacturers um, have got their hardware down, but they haven't been able to make the leap to software. And uh, you know, just like uh, you know, with uh, with Plays for Sure and stuff, you know, Microsoft has some software that they can go license, but it's on a fairly small number of phones, and it's of a certain caliber. And and uh, and so, if you really look at an iPhone, it's software wrapped in really wonderful hardware. And so, people, the usual suspects, will try to copy the hardware. And it will take them some time. And, and maybe they will, and maybe they won't be able to copy the hardware. But the software is at least five years ahead of anything we've seen uh, out there. And it's really hard to do it. Um, we, you know, we've spent years working on this. But remember that we started with an operating system that we've been working on for you know, well over a decade when we started. And we started with uh, a browser, Safari, which is what's in iPhone. Uh, which is regarded by many as the best browser in the world. All right, but I have to stop you there. Yeah. Does the iPhone, it doesn't really have the entire Mac OS X operating system, which, which is gigabytes and gigabytes on, on the computer. It doesn't really have the entire Safari browser, which I don't know how much space it takes up, but yeah, it, more than you've got on the phone, right? I mean. So the answer is yes, it does. And the entire Mac operating system is when you get it on a disk, is gigabytes, a lot of it's data. If you take out the data, 
What do you mean by dating? Well, we don't need foreign every, languages. Yeah, and we don't need every desktop pattern that we ship. We don't need every sound file that we ship. If you take out the data, the operating system is actually not that huge. And if you look at Safari, Safari is not that huge. No, it's got real OS X, real Safari, real desktop email, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we own those apps, so we could take Safari and take all of that work that we put into it and put a very different user interface on it to work with the multi-touch screen. And if you don't own a browser, that's pretty hard to do. You know, so I, it's, it's an amazing amount of software. So theoretically, there, there, there's a business decision and a technical issue here. On the technical side, theoretically, could a Mac OS X app run on an iPhone if you thought that was a good idea? Well, we don't think that's a good idea. Yeah. And obviously, we don't want to have a mouse on our phone, and we don't have pull-down menus and right. things like that. So um, we think there's a very different user interface for the phone. OK. Uh, talk to me. Let's, I, I want to get up and uh, do this demo in, in a second. But to lead up to that, uh, one of the big kind of holy grails has been, one has been to have a great pocket internet device, mm -hmm. and you're, you're working on that. One has been to connect the internet or the content on your computers and the internet to your TV. Mm -hmm. And we talked to, I talked a little to Les Moonves about that. Uh, obviously, Microsoft has, uh, as you pointed out, made some previous efforts. Sure. They have a new effort where the Xbox sort of serves that function. And there are, you know, millions of Xboxes out there. Um, uh, this is what Apple TV, I think, is about. Um, uh, why isn't it, why do you describe it as a hobby? Why isn't it something that is just, it's two ninety nine. it's, uh, I mean, when I tested it, it was very easy to set up. Uh, you can bring it into a house that has absolutely no other Apple products in it. It could be an all Windows household. Right. As long as you have iTunes on those machines, your photos and your, all that stuff will show up on your TV. Why isn't it like dead simple to imagine people wanting to buy that in large numbers? You know, I think, what everybody's tried, and the place where we've come from too, is coming from the personal computer market, you first think about getting content from your PC into your living room on your widescreen TV. And I'm not so sure that's really what most consumers want. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's great to show your photos. It's great to play your music that you have on your PC wirelessly and get that all on there. But we tend to think of that as the entree. And the more we think about this, the more we think that might just be the peas on the side, you know? And that the entree really might be things that you get directly from the internet. But interestingly, when you introduced Apple TV, it was only the peas that you That's were right. talking about. So today, we're learning. today, are you going to talk about the Yeah, I wanted to, I brought something to show you if you'd like. Okay, let's, let's do it. Um, so I've got I'm telling you, Leopard delayed. Again, he's <laughs> so mesmerized by these. I mean, so, so again, it's just it's, it's one more piece of the puzzle, but uh, it's amazing how fun it is to watch this stuff in your living room rather than just on your okay. computer. So this is the first uh, thing or, or additional feature of Apple TV yeah. that goes right out to the internet and gets right. you something other than a preview. You can actually get full videos. Um, why not just build in a feature that lets me go anywhere on the internet and get any video that's well, out there? that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Let's okay. do it. <laughs> Are you going to do it? I think, you know, over the, in the fullness of time, I think that all, all these things are going to percolate from us, from others, and there'll be all sorts of interesting things happening. And we're going to be there with, with our collection of interesting things. But you're going to have a collection of interesting things rather than me, the user, with my Apple TV. Like if I, so if I have a Mac, uh, I can go anywhere on the internet and see anything. With an Apple TV, it looks like you're doing it in a little more structured way. Why? Why not? put some uh, kind of browser, or video browser or something on there. Oh, I, I think maybe you'll see stuff like that. I think a normal web browser is not necessarily what people want right. uh, in their living room. But I think you will see stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so even with the human slingshot and the quick yeah. change That's lady, my species. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's not going to take it from a hobby to a real business. Uh, you uh, know. I use the word hobby just because it's a little provocative in the sense that it's, it's, this is, the iPod started this way. I mean, the iPod's a really great phenomenon today, and it's a big business today, but it started off a little smaller. 
and uh, uh, it started off feeling a lot like this. So, okay, and you're but you're committed to this. Totally. Uh, oh yeah. Television uh, uh, set. To, it's really a set top box that. No, it's not a set top box. Things. I mean, that's what screwed no, us. I don't up. mean it's a cable box, but yeah. it's another set top box, right? Well, that's not how we look at it. That's that's what screwed us up for a few years. Is we we've, we've wanted to do this for a few years. And we thought of it as a set-top box replacement. And the minute you're going to replace the set-top box, you get into an entire real gnarly set of problems. You know, because you have to have the cable cards, and you have to kind of go through the cable companies to get to market. And uh, they use this very strange software called OCAP that you have to implement so that you can implement their billing systems and all sorts of other things like that. And we would never, that, that just isn't something we would choose to do ourselves. And so we didn't do it. We didn't do it because we couldn't see a go-to-market strategy that made sense. But then one day we realized, wait a minute. There's a lot more DVD players out there than there even are set-top boxes. We don't have to replace the set-top box. The DVD player didn't replace the set-top box. We just have to be, we want to be a DVD player for this new internet age. And that's what we can be. And so our model for Apple TV is like a, a DVD player for the internet. So when, when you bring an Apple TV home, or an iPhone actually, and you want to connect it to the computers in your house, yeah. and let's say they're all Windows computers, right. uh, all you need is iTunes software, right? Right. You, you don't need to go into the Windows control panel and set up, you know, they have their method for setting up a network and right. connecting devices and all, but you just take care of that all inside iTunes. Well, yeah, you did it. You know what it's like. I know. Uh, so the question is, how many copies of iTunes are out there? Uh, lots. No, but I mean, how, okay. How, compared to the number of iPods, is it a is it fifty percent more than the number of iPods, or several times more? Several times. So there's like a hundred. I think your announced figure of iPod sales is hundred million. million. You're saying this could be three hundred million copies of iTunes, or more, or more. Yeah. That makes it one of the most that's ubiquitous correct. pieces of software out there. Yeah. Obviously not as much as, say, Windows or something, right. but there's a lot. There's yeah. a ton of them. And almost all of them are on Windows computers. Uh, statistically, yes. <laughs> statistically, re in reality, in this, yeah. in this particular dimension, they're all on Windows exactly. computers. Right? <laughs> so that makes you an enormous Windows software developer. We are. How does that feel? Oh, we've, we've got cards and letters from lots of people that say that iTunes is the, their favorite app on Windows. Uh-huh. But I mean, I, I knew you, I knew you, we, you know, I think here at D actually. It's you like giving you, a glass of ice water to somebody in hell. <laughs> there's that, there's that humility. There's that Steve Jobs humility. Um, um, I knew that you know you 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 knew that you had to put it on Windows. You hired some Windows developers. You wanted to do it right and uh, all of that. But the scale has, doesn't the scale of it surprise you? I, I mean, over and above however you feel about the success of the iPod itself, people don't pay attention to this. But this this piece of software is just like on all these. Windows computers. It's a, it's the scale a, of a lot of things we're doing surprises me. It's just, yeah. I mean, I never thought we'd ship 100 million iPods, you know? Never. No. Even when you, I mean, you're well, not known as a guy who, doesn't, who lacks confidence, so you must have thought it was going to succeed, right? Yeah, but 100 million, is a, for us, it's a very big number. Right. The, be, the bigger number for you is the 80% share or the 75% share or whatever it is, right? I mean, that's not a kind of a share number you're used to. Well, I suppose we'd rather ship 100 million and have a lesser share than have 80% of a 10 million unit market. Right. But. Um, do you think video on portable devices is a success, is a big deal? Do people want it? And it's not only, uh, I, I mean, I remember when you were, well, you, you were here at one point, and you said you didn't think people wanted to watch video on small devices. Yeah. And then even after you shipped it, you made some statements that you, were, you personally weren't 100% sure how many people wanted to do it. Um, I was definitely more skeptical than customers. And uh, what happened was with the iPod video, uh, boy, they proved, us, they proved us wrong. 
And a lot of people, you know, we go out and talk to our customers a lot and do a lot of research on that. And uh, uh, video has been the number one or two reason people have bought that product. And they use it a lot. So, and, you know, again, we've, we've sold uh, the better part of, uh, you know, 100 million television shows. So it's... And you have any way to tell whether those are on iPods or primarily being viewed on... We on don't except by going out and asking people. Computers. We, and, and it's both. Uh, but people have watched a lot of video on those iPods. And, and the screens are, you know, the screens are small and they're, you know, $249 and things like that. So I think, I think video is here to stay on portable devices. And I think its use will only grow. So, but you don't have video. I mean, the iPhone can play video, but you don't have a video service that, that allows people to download videos, I don't think, on the iPhone, do you? Sure we do. You do? It's just because it's an iPod, all those videos you've bought for your iPod play perfectly on the iPhone. Right, but I can't nice download screen. them directly to iPhone, right? Over the air. Yeah, no. over the air. No. Why not? I mean, uh, uh, and I, I mean, you know that a lot of the cell phone carriers, including AT&T, are doing this. Yeah. You know that Qualcomm has this whole new, uh, uh, essentially, cell phone television network right. that they've started. I mean, this is a big deal, and it's a big deal in other countries. Yeah. Uh, you're bringing uh, out this phone with this. Well, huge people have screen. tried it with music, so far, and it's failed. And part of the reason that it's failed is that uh, a phone isn't necessarily the best place for discovering or browsing through large catalogs of music to figure out what you want to buy. All right. And then when you download it to the phone, it costs more money because the airwaves cost more than the terrestrial internet. And then when you get it on your phone, you've got to sync it back to your PC anyway, because if you lose your phone or trade in your phone, you don't want to lose a few hundred dollars worth of music. So you can either buy it on your phone for more money in, in a less good environment and sync it back to your PC, or you can buy it on your PC in much bigger screen, you know, easier way to buy, and then sync it to your phone. And uh, you know, we, again, we've got 100 million uh, iPods we've sold that people know how to sync to their PCs. They know how to buy music on iTunes. And it's just you know, second nature to just sync it to the iPod. So you have no plans at the moment to put any version of the iTunes store, either for music or video, on the iPhone itself, despite the fact you have a big screen and you have this uh, yeah. non-baby operating system. And you, you we certainly know. have nothing to announce today. Oh, really? OK. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, well, why don't we take some questions, and then we'll, uh, then we'll go to lunch. Yes, sir. Hi, Steve. Evan Pagan, Hot Topic Media. I read in an article that you personally still pick up the phone and call to recruit people. And I'm wondering, do uh, you have any tips uh, on what you look for and how you look for it in talent? Oh, that's a long discussion. But I will say. Take as long as you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> it's his conference, actually. Uh, I, I would say that I think you know, in our businesses, I mean, we don't build $4 billion semiconductor fab facilities that provide barriers to entry to competition and things like that. We're not a capital intensive industry like that. Uh, and so all we are is our ideas, which means all we are is our people. And that's what keeps us going to work in the morning is a chance to hang around all these great, bright people. So uh, I've always felt and, and, and still feel even more strongly that recruiting is like the, the heart and soul of what we do. And it's really important. Thank you. Yeah. Blake. Hi, Blake Krikorian from Sling. Uh, two, two questions, uh, two-part question. One, Steve, you mentioned uh, 3G and the lack of high-quality applications for 3G. Absolutely agree, but um, the iPhone is a 2.5G phone right now, right? So can you comment on that? Sure. Well, it's actually a really interesting thing. Uh, it's a 2.5G uh, phone plus Wi-Fi. Plus Wi-Fi. Right. And it automatically switches to Wi-Fi whenever it finds Wi-Fi. And it just switches to the fastest network automatically. And you don't even have to think about it. And you know, I'm in this industry, and, and we were the first people to ever ship Wi-Fi in a notebook computer and you know, have the first cheap Wi-Fi base stations out there and stuff. So we're really into it. Ship the first G, ship the first N. Uh, and so we're really you know, we're around Wi-Fi all the time. The iPhone has a feature that when you're um, when you're in a place, if, if you choose to join a network, it remembers that. If you're in the same place, it'll just automatically join that network if it's the fastest one. 
But when you're in a place where you've never joined a network and it finds them, it'll just alert you to that and say you want to join one of these things. And so, you know, I live in Palo Alto, so there's a fair amount of Wi-Fi, I would figure, but it's everywhere. You, you, walk, you walk, you know, 10 blocks and you're going to encounter 50 Wi-Fi networks, you know? I mean, some of them are people's personal ones that you can just, you know, take a ride on. <laughs> others, are in, others are in stores of one form or another. It's everywhere. And I had, yeah, there's like 10 times more Wi-Fi out there than even I thought there was. And I live in this industry every day. So um, Wi-Fi is, of course, way faster than any 3G. And uh, uh, Edge turns out to be pretty fast, too, actually, because it's a point-to-point -point connection. I've been really surprised at how good Edge is. And then the, the second question is, you talked about the internet in your pocket. And so I would assume that you know, the whole beauty of the internet is its diversity and its totality. So how is it going to be an uh, internet in your pocket when it's over one of these orifices? Or through one of these orifices? Orifices? Will, will, will it be? Yeah, there was a guy who mentioned last year about these orifices. Oh. If you remember. Yeah. Um, the, well, no, no, how, how is that going to happen? I mean, it, the open internet, does that mean it's, it's full-blown internet functionality over the singular network? Yes. Cool. That's what it means. Great. Thanks. Yeah, over here. Uh, hi, Brian Quinn from Dow Jones Online. I want to talk about one of Walt's um, favorite topics, which is advertising. And uh, Apple's been done some of the most memorable advertising uh, in history, from the commercial was voted the best of all time, 1984, to the Think Different campaign, to the iPod Silhouette campaign, and the campaign that's advertised that's on now, which I think is just wonderful, the Mac versus PC. Uh, the question I asked you, though, is, is more about media choice. And, and uh, when you think of Mac, uh, well, I, you wouldn't say arguably, but the, the far superior operating system. But for the most part, Apple has really never advertised Mac on the Internet. Um, and uh, those of us who sell online advertising think of what a great opportunity because 95% of the people that would see your Mac advertising are using the inferior product. And I'm just curious about... <laughs> Uh, if you see that as an opportunity that you've, that you've missed, or it's just not, not uh, top of mind. But advertising well, the Mac, actually we, a lot of people are using an inferior product, would seem to be a good opportunity. Well, without getting into that, I can say that our Mac versus PC campaign, we do advertise on the internet quite a bit. But, but not on those porn sites that you were talking about. <laughs> Over here. Uh, Brian Deere from Eventful. Um, Steve, the, all indications so far and I, uh, are that the iPhone is, like you say, you know, a beautiful piece of software wrapped in a beautiful piece of hardware. Oh, thanks. And the fact that it's running on OS X is a fantastic development. I think I, I would speak for many developers, perhaps thousands of independent developers, who would love to write apps for that platform because I believe it's going to be a tremendous platform for the future. But the indications are so far that it's closed, and I was wondering if you could comment on that, and do you see it opening up for developers in the future? Sure, it's a good question. Uh, this is a, a very important trade-off between security and openness, right? And what we want is we want both. We want to have our cake and eat it too. And uh, so we're working through a way. We've got some pretty good ideas that we're working through, and I think uh, sometime later this year, uh, we will find a way to do that because that is our intent. Find a way to open it up so that third-party developers find a way to let third parties write apps and still preserve the security. But at the start, until you until get that we can in place, find that way, uh, we can't compromise the security of the phone. You, this is something. Is that this has a to network work. issue? Is this an AT&T issue? I mean, what, when you say the security of the phone, you know, I, I won't mention names, but I've used. You know, we've all used a lot of smartphones that crash more than once a day. And the uh -huh. more third-party apps you put on them, the more they crash. And uh, we don't, you know, we're going to, nobody's perfect, but, but we'd sure like our phone not to crash uh, once a day or more. And so we would like to solve this problem. I think we're going down some really good avenues to do it. If you could just be a little more patient with us, I think everybody can get what they want. Thank you. Yep. Over here. Jim Balkan with Polyfuel. Steve, I must be one of the weirdos. Thank you very much for this uh, video iPod. My kids and I watch all kinds of TV shows, even sharing with uh, one little screen and one earphone in each, in, uh, each of our ears. So thanks very much. We're one of the weirdos well, that you. does that. Um, we work with a lot of the Asian consumer electronics companies that you say don't do software particularly well. And we're working to try and help enable them to run 
extended run times on their portable devices so that they can get these devices to, to deal with live TV. And one of the things that they complain about is that limited battery run time is one of the things that's limiting their ability to do that or people to buy that. What's your view on that? Well, I think when you're talking about a portable device, whether it be a notebook or an iPod or a phone, uh, it's all about power. It's all about battery life. And so uh, fortunately, we've been fighting that fight for a long, long time with our notebooks, right, with our Macs. And so uh, we've got a lot of technology for managing power. I think Macs are pretty well known for managing power quite a bit, you know, kind of the best of breed in the PC industry. And uh, we've applied a lot of that and learned a lot more from iPods. And so uh, we were able to bring all of that, that all those things we'd learned together uh, in the phone. And uh, I, I'd say you've hit upon one of the, the key problems in portable devices, is just power. Thank you. Yeah. Jan? Uh, Steve, first of all, thank you also. Um, I'm a 20-year-plus Mac addict and still hooked. I wanted to ask you a question Two years ago when you were here, you'd had a really rough time, and I asked you how you were. Apple is healthy, and you had been through all kinds of hell. Two years later, two and a half years later, how are you now? Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm still vertical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm feeling great, thank you. You look great. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Dave Jaworski with Pass Along Networks, and we have about two million songs in MP3 format today that we use to power FYE, Sam Goody, and other brands. And uh, when we have the EMI catalog, it will be MP3. You talk about interoperability and how DRM-free opens that up. But your DRM-free is AAC. So if I have a Sony reader that, has, that plays MP3 files, it, I can play any song I buy in MP3 format or that I rip from CDs. If I have uh, my Garmin GPS, it will play MP3 files. But if I buy DRM-free from iTunes, I have to go through a transcoding process, and the consumer doesn't really understand transcoding, or else they have to rip it and burn it. In their case, they're no better off than they were with buying a DRM file, and they lose all the metadata, the artist name, the track name. Why not make Apple's DRM-free mean MP3 and get rid of the confusion that is being created for the consumer? Um, well, the answer, first of all, let me point out a few things. Let me point out a few things. Number one, uh, of course, all the MP3s that you guys sell will play just fine on iPods. Uh, and number two, uh, the reason we chose AAC in the first place is for a given data rate, it's, it's significantly superior to MP3 in its audio quality. So it's a much better encoder. And we don't own it. We license it. Anyone can go license it. As a matter of fact, a bunch of people have. Microsoft has, uh, most of the players out there have gone and licensed AAC, and they do play AAC. So uh, I'm sure you can name a list of people that don't, but they can easily go out and license it and they'll play it. But most of the big players out there now do play AAC, because A, it is a superior codec, and B, they want to be able to play stuff that iTunes, people rip their CDs in iTunes, and they most of them choose to rip it into AAC, they want to be able to play that stuff, and they can today. Anyone can go license AAC. It is a totally open standard. And they're not licensing it from you. They're not licensing it from us. Some industry body yeah, or somebody. Absolutely. Like, yeah. So just like MP3, by the way, MP3 isn't free. We go license it from an industry body. AAC is actually much simpler to license than MP3 is. So we're not trying to keep anybody out. We're just trying to use a superior technology, which results in much better audio quality at any given data rate. And uh, others seem to agree with us because they seem to be putting AAC into their products more and more. And so, you know, you could encode all your stuff in AAC if you wanted to as well. It'd be really easy. Thank you. But even if you don't, all the iPods still play MP3. Over here. Uh, Jonathan Kaplan from Pure Digital Technologies. Uh, always great to have you on stage. It's enjoyable to listen to you, Steve. Thanks. Um, my question is really around capture. Um, I'm the CEO of a young company that makes capture devices, and traditionally Apple has stayed out of the capture part of both still and video. And with the iPhone now, there is a camera on there, so capturing still will happen. And I'm just curious how worried I need to be about you, uh, <laughs> deciding that you want to get into the capture space, given that the on-ramp to the YouTubes of the world tend to uh, be big devices that are difficult to connect with terrible software. Well, I mean, we do also build video cameras into most of our computers now. 
And uh, you can't so, take those with you. So what's that? You don't take those really. That's not a very portable way to capture video. Move your Mac around too. Oh, well, MacBooks are pretty pretty tiny. <laughs> but uh, the, the uh, woman on the uh, on the slingshot uh, could hold her MacBook while she's flying through the air. <laughs> uh, Phil Schiller held a MacBook as he jumped off a. Yeah, but uh, yeah, uh, we you know we. We're not planning on getting into the camcorder market. That's a great that's answer. That's what your answer. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, we actually have time for one more question. I'm sorry, uh, right over here. Thank you. Uh, Steve, thanks for being here. I'm Scott Heiferman from Meetup. Um, uh, you, you, you shook my world. You um, uh, are, have been a hero of mine when I heard, um, uh, when I was 12 years old, you know, that you challenged John Scully to change the world. Um, you seem obsessed with, uh, I, I was going to ask a silly question, like do you read the fake, st fake Steve Jobs blog? But the real question here that is meaningful uh, to me is, what, um, uh, you're obsessed with Hollywood and entertainment and all these, you know, these, these movie trailers and stuff, but um, is that irrelevant or what, 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 what really changes the world moving forward? Uh, I have read a few of the fake Steve Jobs things recently, and I thought they were pretty funny. And I, and I get asked a lot if I know who it is, and I don't. Uh, but, it, but it is pretty funny. Uh, and, uh, I don't write it. <laughs> maybe it's Walt. Uh, and and I, I am interested in storytelling. Uh, I got involved with, with Pixar a long time ago, and... and uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm the, the, one, of the, one of the cheerleaders at Disney still, and I, I love a lot of stuff that they do. Um, so I love storytelling. But what we do at Apple is, is uh, we try to make tools for people in the end, and tools to enjoy entertainment, tools to communicate, uh, tools to create, whether it's Macs or, or, or phones or, or iPods. And, uh, what we find is, is that you know, this age we're living in, these computer-based tools, can always surprise you on the upside. You know? uh, we didn't design Apple TV thinking about YouTube, but here it is. Uh, we didn't design iTunes uh, thinking about education, but one of the things we announced this morning was called iTunes U, where there's like, you know, I think it's 17 universities and there's hundreds in the pipe, are putting their courseware on iTunes to where their students and even anybody can access it. And these are they're, what they're doing is they're taping lectures, either audio or videotaping lectures, by their best professors. And they're putting them on their servers so their students don't have to sit there and take notes and not pay attention to the lecture. They can just listen to the lecture, and they can go get a copy of it and put it on their iPod and take notes later. And alumni can get at it, and you know, kids that don't even go to the university can get at it. And you know, it's MIT and Stanford and Berkeley and all these great universities. And this is iTunes, and it's free. And so, you know, who would have thought? And so that's why I love what we do, because we make these tools, and they're constantly surprising us in new ways and what we can do with them. So, Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank